So what misallocation in the simplest possible way means is that uh, basically marginal products are an equalized. Traditionally, theories always just said the reason why a country is underdeveloped is because it, it lacks, I don't know, total resources. So there isn't enough capital in the economy, there isn't enough human capital, there isn't enough land that you can farm, and so on. Um, and there's this relatively new idea that um, it's not just the total number or amount of resources that matter, it's also the allocation of resources in the economy. So the question is, are uh, marginal products of, of capital equalized? And there's pretty strong evidence that they aren't. Interest rates provide a lower bound on individual marginal products. Then you look around in developing countries and you see and, and, and look at what interest rates people are prepared to pay for, for loans for productive purposes. And you see crazy numbers like 50%, 80%, or even like above 100% per year. The, mar the aggregate marginal product is pretty much almost always, always below 10% everywhere. So how do you reconcile those two? Um, the pretty obvious answer is that it, like the aggregate, like the average sort of, is, is very different from individual ones. That so just means that they can't be equalized. The big question sort of from a macro development point of view is can these financial frictions and this capital misallocation explain uh, large differences in, in GDP first of all and then also in total factor productivity. You can't really explain the differences between countries with the total amount of resources they have. Basically aggregate resources don't really explain anything um, and this is why some people think it's the, the allocation of resources. Also, you want to see how, how wealth inequality is affected by financial frictions. The short detour I want to make is um, standard growth theory, which I've kind of already hinted at. And I want, to, I want to say like why it really doesn't work very well. Robinson Crusoe is like the representative consumer and the representative firm in one. So you just vote that he's the guy and he owns production technology. Obviously, this is not a realistic um, representation of the economy because there's not just one Robinson Crusoe, there's like a bunch of guys. How do you justify this? So the one justification is like all people are identical. I mean, very clearly they are. But if they're kind of identical, it might not matter so much. The other justification is that markets are perfect. This approach, because it either assumes that people are identical or it assumes that markets are perfect, just completely assumes away all misallocation. A bunch of people have said, okay, how do we deal with this? Um, and they, they've come up with something which people here call non-aggregate growth theory or um, heterogeneous agent models or so on. The idea is just that you somehow build in heterogeneity in the economy. Each, each individual is a potential firm owner um, with a production function. Also, individuals have some wealth and we just write G of A and Z is the joint distribution at time T. We assume that there's some capital market imperfection. In particular, um, how much capital you can use depends on your wealth. The idea is just that if you go to a bank and you say, oh, I've got this really a good project, so I have a very high Z, I want to take out $1,000, the bank's going to say, well, wait a minute, um, how do I know you're going to repay me? You have to uh, put up some collateral, and the collateral is is, is your wealth. The other uh, assumption is that there's a credit market and um, which is competitive except for this credit market imperfection and the interest rate R is determined in general equilibrium. Um, individuals are forward looking as well. The alternative to acquiring capital on the market though is to accumulate it, right? So you can just always you know you're very high ability, the, the bank won't give you the money, so you're just gonna try to save it up yourself. And actually, if you look at a model like this, this is going to be a very strong force to eliminating this misallocation. What we can show actually is that very quickly, this, this like gap in marginal product is going to disappear. So something's wrong with this model because obviously this misallocation does seem to be there in the data. So what, what, what can we do to like fix this model in the most easy way? So some people have argued that with fixed costs, you get, uh, you get big um, output effects and big, big TFP differences. What these fixed costs do, I mean, in, in terms of 
uh, technical language, they introduce what's called a non-convexity in the production function. If you have fixed costs of starting up a firm, there's going to be a bunch of people who, who think they're not going to be productive enough to recruit the fixed cost, so they, they won't produce at all. And, and there's going to be a bunch of other people who are going to produce. So now you're actually going to have two forms of misallocation, which I want to stress, which is one is what we call misallocation on the intensive margin, which is just exactly what we had before, that marginal products aren't equalized. Misallocation on the extensive margin, which means that the wrong people are in business, basically. Can you still get um, this, mis this persistent misallocation that we observe in the data? And the answer is both yes and no. This is kind of interesting because what you're going what you are going to be able to get is big GDP and TFP differences because of the wrong guys being in business. Um, so you're kind of halfway there, but the one thing you are not going to get is big intensive margin misallocation, which is something we see in the data. So there's this like kind of inconsistency. Why does this misallocation persist? The next possible step is like is to introduce shocks into the model. You see a lot of um, family firms in developing countries. At first, the, the the companies are managed by the by the very able manager, but then the manager dies at some point, and he gets this really stupid child, and this really stupid child takes over the company and then just like runs it into the ground. So uh, this is uh, called dynastic management, and it's one theory. So we can easily incorporate that in here with almost the same model. But here are the two savings policy functions for the two types. So this is the low type and this is the high type. The low type has a lower target wealth than the high type. So the low type is going to die, and he, he gets a child, which is the high ability type. So for him, the savings policy function is this one right here. So he's going to start accumulating towards his target wealth level. And here, I don't know. So say here, somewhere here, the, he dies again. Then the, he gets a child, but the child stays high ability. Then they go in here. But then he dies again, child is low ability. So there you start moving around in this thing somehow. And basically we want to solve for uh, the, the distribution of wealth that is generated by this like turning around um, and see how production is affected. So what you get is these wealth distributions. Um, so the target wealth levels are here and the guys are going to try to move towards them. Uh, but then they're hit by a shock and so they're going to be somewhere here in the middle. And this is exactly what's going to um, generate misallocation in this model, is that not everyone is at their target wealth levels. If you look at like data, what the wealth distribution looks like, kind of looks similar to this. So now we want to look at what kind of misallocation you get out. What you actually get, unfortunately, is only a very moderate TFP effect with a realistic calibration. In order to get something, you should rather look at much higher frequency shocks. We just want to think about people having different ideas and, and those kind of things, and those ideas switching very quickly over time. Also, what we want to look at is the dynamics of the distribution. So in particular, you can let ability be a diffusion, it's called. Um, so this is a sample path where typical diffusion is called an ornstein Hindenburg process. So it just like kind of wiggles around very fast. And then you can, from that, kind of back up what the aggregate distribution of ability and wealth is. In the beginning, I, I, I asked, can financial frictions explain large TP differences and GDP differences? Um, and under what circumstances? In particular, can you explain high um, capital misallocation on the intensive margin? Yes, if ability shocks are frequent enough. And also that convergence, so like, Saving up out of these foreign constraints is fast enough, uh, is, is slow enough. So, so there are these two counteracting forces, right? You're being hit by shocks, but at the same time, you you, you kind of save yourself out of the out of the boring constraints. What we don't think is an important issue is these dynastic management issues. That's because, as I said before, lifetimes are just too long 